You know, it's an honor and blessing to see individuals fight. <laughs> and there's no victory without a fight. That's what victory is, isn't it? <laughs> it's a fight. And we are in a constant battle. Hallelujah. We got the battle within and the battle out. And you must be able to conquer the battle that's within because if you don't, you can't conquer the one that's out. It's impossible. So you first must conquer the one in. As you begin to conquer the one in, you begin to earn the trust of the Lord. He won't give you any more than you can handle, and he won't give you any more until you have victory in an area that he's putting you through. He holds you there until you're ready for the next part. In fact, he allows you to go around the mountain again. And so, and you never know when the test is going to come. <laughs> but I can tell you it always comes because there is no promotion without a test. So we've got to come to that point where we have victory within. Amen? Praise God. Would you grab your swords and go to Mark 13? Mark 13. Thank you, Jesus. Mark 13 and verse 3. Now as he, Jesus, sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew answered him, asked him privately. He, they said, tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled. And Jesus, answering them, began to say, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, which is a representation of ethnic groups, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places. We have in those now. And there will be famines. Are we having those now? Amen. And troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. But watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations, but when they arrest you and deliver you up, don't worry about beforehand or be uh, concerned what you will speak. But whatever is given to you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now brethren will betray brethren to death. And the father, his child, and the children rise up against the parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated for be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who what? Endures to the end shall be saved. He who endures. And I'm going to share with you that without endurance, it is difficult to have victory. In fact, it is impossible to have victory without endurance. Amen? In Hebrews 10. So it says here that you can't be saved unless you endure. And those who endure to the end are saved. In Hebrews chapter 10. In verse 26. Everybody there? For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, 
there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Hebrews 10, 26. So you are open for the devil to take you out if you sin willfully. In other words, you have broken covenant and you are not under the covering of the Lord. Has everybody got it? And if you have broken covenant with God and not under the covering of the Lord, that's when the enemy loves to take you out because he knows you won't make it home. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and then fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who's rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses of how much worse punishment you suppose will be thought worthy who have trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you what? You endured a great struggle with suffering. Partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. I said great reward. For you have need of what? Endurance. So that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise or the reward. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe in the saving of the soul. So we see here that the first thing we talked about is endure to the end, you'll be saved. And here we, say, we see now that there's endurance of great struggle with sufferings, isn't there? These are three kinds of Endurances and there's endurance of the struggle with sufferings. The second endurance is in James 1. Of course, I guess if you looked all sorts of places, you could find a lot of endurances. <laughs> but there's categories of them. And the first one is the struggling with sufferings most of the time you're struggling with yourself <laughs> I'm struggling really <laughs> who are you struggling with me <laughs> James chapter 1 and verse 12 says blessed is the man who what endures what temptation so this is the second endurance to endure temptation for when he has uh, been approved he will receive what a crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him so there's a reward isn't there amen so there's a reward when you endure the third endurance is the endurance of your works in first Corinthians 3 1 Corinthians chapter 3. <coughs> Hallelujah. In verse 10, chapter 3, verse 10, according to the grace of God, and we know the grace of God is God's plan. 
which was given to me, says Paul, is a wise master builder. I've laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let one, each one take heed in how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. In other words, if it's built according to the grace of God or the plan of God, he will receive a reward. Does everybody got it? It did not say that if you build by what doctrine tells you, it says if you build by what God tells you. Does everybody got this? He will receive a reward. Is everybody okay? So we see here works. Why? Because we must be led by the Spirit. In this, this is the importance of being in the Spirit. Because if you're not in the Spirit, it's impossible to receive the things of the Spirit. In Hebrews 12. So there are many who are trying to build the things of God by doctrine, not by revelation. Hebrews 12. Praise God. <coughs> Hebrews 12 and verse 1. Let's speak this together. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. In other words, listen, you have need to run with endurance. That is a part of your new life. You run with it. Endurance is to go through. You are enduring. You know, when a storm comes, it means you hold on. There's a time when we hold on. There's a time when we wait. Patience is associated with endurance. Sometimes people can't wait because they can't endure. And then they have to do something. Amen? So we are to run with endurance. And we can always look at how Jesus had to endure for me and you. So if you think your suffering is tough and so forth look at what he went through amen so we need to run with endurance again and there's three types of endurance that we were talking about that's struggle with sufferings endurance of temptations and the endurance of your works everyone has a reward in fact if you endure all the way to the end salvation you are saved and 1 Corinthians 13. All glory. 1 Corinthians 13. Is everybody there? In verse 3. Let's speak it. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me what? Nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. 
is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not, does not what? Rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfected is come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. He's talking about the love that is associated with maturing. It is called perfect love. It's called, it's an area where an individual has love because they're maturing. It's maturing love within us. This is the fruits of maturing love in us. Is everybody with me? <coughs> for now I see in a mirror dimly but then face to face now I know in part but then I shall know just as I also am known and now abide faith hope love these three but the greatest of these is love so love endures all things doesn't it so where there's endurance is there love yes you can't endure without love See, the world tries to endure with its own strength. We endure with the love of Christ. Because the world can't endure what you endure. Amen? Your endurance is a different thing than the world. Because the world's endurance is for self-fame. Your endurance is for the fame of Christ. It's different. So what helps you to endure is to maintain the love of Christ. Amen. First John four. Oh, hallelujah. First John chapter four. So when people don't endure, it's because the love of Christ is not being perfected in them. First John chapter 4 and verse 17. All glory. Yeah, let's start somewhere else. Okay, let's start at 16. <laughs> and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves what? Torment. So where there is torment, there is fear. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God, whom he has not seen? So, it says here that there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Now grab hold of this because fear is your enemy. Everyone say, fear is my enemy. Because fear nullifies faith. Fear nullifies faith. Now here's the kicker. Fear is the protector of pride. Come on. Fear is the protector of 
pride, which is the enemy of grace or God's plan. Fear is the nullifier of faith and the protector of pride. And pride is the enemy of grace, which is the plan of God in your life. So to maintain love, to endure, takes two things, consistency and discipline. It's going to take what? Consistency and discipline. Now we're going to go a little further. To maintain the love to endure takes consistency and discipline. And this consistency and discipline is the submission to doctrine which tutors us or I want to say infenses us. And he tutors, it tutors us or infenses us to the mentoring of the Holy Spirit. So it's always leading us to the mentoring of the Holy Spirit. So everybody grab hold of this. I want you to get vision on this. To maintain love to endure, it takes consistency and discipline. Remember, discipline leads to relationship. Relationship leads to love affair. So if you're not consistent, it's impossible to maintain a love affair. Amen? So if you're not disciplined, you can't be consistent, can you? Okay. And in this, what we have to do, we've got to come to a place we are submitting to the doctrine, which is written. Submission to the doctrine. Why? Because doctrine infenses us. And the doctrine that infenses me and you is always leading me and you because doctrine is called tutor. The law is known as the tutor. The Holy Spirit is known as the mentor. So now in this doctrine that is infencing us, its purpose is to keep us in the arena that is always leading us to the mentoring of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going somewhere, so just hang tough. First Corinthians chapter 2. In verse 1. Now you got to remember, Paul was under the law known as the tutor. But he didn't obey it. <laughs> In fact, some of the people, he, Paul was a Pharisee who was under the law, under the tutor, but he did not obey it. In fact, some of the ones that he was under gave him documents to go kill, which is against the law. Thou shalt not kill, right? <laughs> but he was approved by the Sanhedrin of the Pharisees to go out and kill those who were of the way or believers, which they came against the law themselves. So in this arena of his non-submission to that, he was way out of order, wasn't he? There was no mentoring of the Holy Spirit whatsoever. There was no fellowship. And he says, and I, brother, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Well, Paul's attitude got changed when he got slam dunked in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak 
wisdom of God in a mystery. And that word mystery means revelation. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they had known, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So speak, Paul was talking about speaking with the wisdom of God in a mystery. He called it, it was a hidden wisdom ordained for our glory. This hidden wisdom, this mystery is known as revelation, something that is revealed. He said, so that we should have eyes to see and ears to hear. In other words, revealed by the mentoring of the Holy Spirit. Again, uh, the mystery is called revelation. It's called what? Revelation. Now go to 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 1. First Corinthians 4 verse 1 it says let a man so consider us as servants of Christ in other words you and I are servants to the anointing we are servants to what the anointing which is the eternal presence power and truth of God Almighty the anointing doesn't serve you you serve the anointing let a man so consider us as servants of Christ servants to the anointing and stewards of the mysteries of God or stewards of revelations. We are stewards of the revelations of God. We are to be stewards of these things. So that means that we are to be having revelations. Has everybody got it? We are servants to the anointing and stewards of revelations. In 1 Samuel chapter 3. So we are needing love to endure. Amen. Perfect love casts out all fear. And that means that we must to maintain this love to endure. There's two things we must maintain and that's discipline and consistency, which means submission to doctrine. Doctrine is the infenced arena that you and I are established in, which is always leading me and you to the mentoring of the Holy Spirit. For what? Revelation. Glory to the Lamb. Why? Because we are servants to the anointing and stewards of revelations. In 1 Samuel chapter 3. Is everybody okay? You got this. You got this envisioned. Hallelujah. Now, Eli was the prophet at that time. But there's something that happened with Eli. He began to backslide. And the reason why he began to backslide, because he had two sons that were fornicating. He had two sons that were misusing the tabernacle. And the Lord raised up a young man called Samuel. Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. Well, hello? Why wasn't there widespread revelation? Because the man that was supposed to be the steward of revelation was out of order. He was out of line. Verse 2, and it came to pass at that time when Eli was lying down in his place, when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see. I want to share something with you. Revelation is sight. It's vision. The prophet was becoming blind because he had no revelation. In 
Verse 2 again, and it came to pass at the time while Eli was lying down in his place and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see. And before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, <coughs> that the Lord called Samuel and he answered, here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call you. Lie down again. And he went and lay down again. And then the Lord called yet another time, Samuel. So Samuel rose and went to Eli again. And he said, you called me. And Eli answered and said, man, I didn't call you. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. Samuel did not know the Lord, and he did not know the word of the Lord. He was a young boy. <coughs> and the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am. What did you call me for? Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. First of all, the Lord's voice, a revelation was no longer. So for Eli, oh, must be the voice of God. Haven't heard that in a while. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down and it shall be if he calls you that you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. He didn't say, listen. He said, hears. For your servant hears. He did not say, I'm listening. He said, he hears. Amen. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. Now the Lord came. And stood and, and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, which he knows. Because his sons had made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. Has everybody got it? And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that it, the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So Samuel lay down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision, but he eventually did. So I want you to grab hold of this. Eli had lost revelation because his 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 sins of not know of not revealing or n the knowing of his son's sins, and he did nothing about it. So everybody got it. So we got to understand here that there was no restraint, then was there? He didn't restrain his sons. You know why? Because he had no revelations. And he had no revelations because he knew what was going on and didn't do anything. Is everybody okay? Oh, praise God. So Eli could no longer see because he had no revelation. Because revelation is also the area which brings you to see eternal things, things of the eternal realm. In, in the eternal realm, you can see past, present, or future. There's many things that God reveals to me and you through revelation. Go to Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. All praise be to God. Isaiah 59 and verse 1. Let's speak it together. 
Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated from you, you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perversity. No one calls for justice, nor does anyone plead for truth. They trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. They hatch vipers' eggs and weave the spider's web. He who eats of their eggs dies, and from that which is crushed, a viper breaks out. Again, they cannot hear. God has separated them because of their sins, their iniquities. They have been separated from the Lord, so they are no longer getting revelation or they are no longer hearing the voice of God. Does everybody got this? In Proverbs 29, this is the same thing that happened to Eli, and it's the same thing that happened to many people. Proverbs 29. Everybody there? Proverbs 29, verse 17. It says, correct your son and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. Verse 18. Where there is no... Is anybody there? Is there where there is no what? Revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. In other words, where there's no revelations, there are no restraints of the flesh. And if you keep the law, or keep the doctrine, the infenses, that in, which inf infenses us to the mentoring of the Holy Spirit, so you can get revelation. Has everybody got it? So where there's no revelation, the restraints of the flesh is removed. But if you are submitting to the doctrine which infenses you as the tutor, brings you to the mentoring of the Holy Spirit, always will lead you to revelation. Amen? So the infencing us to the mentoring of the Holy Spirit to bring revelation and eternal sight or vision. We call this the reality of revelation because reality is associated with the things of not seen of eternal. And the only way that that can happen is through revelation. Revelation brings us to the place to see. Amen? Is everybody okay? It's called, we call it re the reality of revelation. Eternal vision by revelation. Eternal vision by revelation. It's called reality of revelation. That's the name of the teaching. Reality of revelation. Just in case you might want to know. Ephesians 1. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 15. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15. Let's speak it. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, in your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation and the knowledge of him. The what? Eyes of your understanding 
being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Now, this is powerful because in this, we see he talks about receiving the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation. He says, and where your eyes are enlightened, in other words, revelation brings vision, doesn't it? It brings sight. So the spirit of revelation, grab, uh, grab hold of this. The spirit of revelation makes us see. The spirit of wisdom gives us understanding of what we see. The spirit of revelation allows us to see. The spirit of wisdom gives us understanding of what we see. It is revelation that unveils what the Lord has already done for me and you. Has everybody got it? It's revelation for me and you that God ours, we already know what he's done for me and you. See, when you know what he's done for you already, you're able to see what he's going to do. You can't see what he's going to do unless you already know what he's done for you. Amen? You must be able to see that. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> doctrine can't save us. The doctrine of Christ cannot save me and you. It is the revelation of Christ that saves me and you. Because it moves us from the arena of written words to relationships. And that's what he desires. The doctrine of Christ cannot save us. But the revelation of Christ does. Because in revelation of Christ, you become submissive. This is where you no longer live for you. You live for him. Because there's been a revelation of him. Now, our growth... And strength in the Lord depends on whether you see or not. Your growth depends on whether you see. And your strength in the Lord depends on whether you see. It doesn't depend on how much doctrine you know or how much you remember. It depends on what you see. That means on what revelations you have and how real he is to you. The reality of revelation will strengthen you. Amen. But the memorization of doctrine will not strengthen you. Has everybody got this? It's revelation that strengthens you. That's why there's a lot of believers who know the words, they even know the stinking page numbers. Man, they can quote it from left to right, right to left and upside down. And still go out and do the same thing over and over and over. Because no revelation. Why? Because restraints are not there without revelation. Amen? Come on, it's time to really get real now. Because he's looking for his children. He's looking for him and us. Not you. He's looking for him. Oh, praise God. Only in the scene... Can we come into the experience? Again, only in the scene can we come into the experience, which makes brings from revelation to reality. Has everybody got it? Because then there's an experience, isn't there? Reality of revelation. Oh, glory. Need endurance to get revelation to see. So revelation is going to bring me and you to reality, isn't it? Which is associated with eternal. So we're going to need endurance to get to revelation, revelation to see. And this, what happens then, opens an entrance to exit. <laughs> it opens an entrance to exit. 
when you are able to see. And in this entrance to exit, it, you, it allows you to escape the enemy. It allows you to decree or teach, to expose or to manifest the grace of God, his plan. Does everybody got that? And y'all look funny tonight. What's up? <laughs> you want me to repeat it? Well, then tell me you didn't get it. <laughs> okay. We are needed in endurance to get revelation to see, because revelation brings us to reality. And that is the entrance to escape. In other words, a door is open for you to get out, to fly, to cruise. And it allows me and you to escape the enemy. Amen. To go into a place to teach, to expose, or to manifest the grace of God, which is his plan. Reality of Revelation. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Let me tell you, this whole teaching is by revelation. To God be the glory. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 11. Is everybody there? Let's speak it. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ, which allowed him... <laughs> Does everybody got it? Allowed him to what? An entrance, right? To exit. Paul wrote the New Testament by revelation. He wrote about the rapture. He wrote about the Gentiles. He wrote about the gifts of the Spirit. Amen. He wrote about the fruits of the Spirit. He wrote about the ministry of the Spirit because he had revelation. He was mentored by the Spirit of the living God that brought him the revelation to reality. And there was open ports, open doors, entrances to exit into other arenas and other dimensions. Hallelujah. Is everybody okay? Verse 13. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. <laughs> he said, man, did I change when I got revelation. Amen. It came by revelation. Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, which I became a minister according to the gift of grace of God given to me 
by the effective working of his power. Wow. So grace was also revealed to Paul. In 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Reality of revelation. Again. Love gives us, brings us to the endurance, doesn't it? Amen. Perfect love casts all, all fear. Fear is your enemy, which nullifies faith. Fear is also the protector of pride, which is the enemy against grace. So perfect love casts out all fear. It allows us to endure so that we are submitting to the doctrine that has infenced us, known as the tutor, bringing us to the mentoring of the Holy Spirit, which brings us to revelation, which brings us to reality, allows us entrance to exit. Amen? Has everybody got this? Allows us to escape the enemy. And allows us to access third dimension. Oh, catch it. <laughs> catch it. And don't let the devil tell you this ain't for me. There's no way I'll re Oh, no, no, no. That's how Paul did as he, Paul prayed in the Holy Ghost. He prayed in tongues. Brought him revelation. That's not a mystical thing. Brought him revelation. Praying in tongues. In this, when you get into that er area which the entrance is open to escape, then what happens? An experience happens. Is everybody okay? And in this area where the experience is manifested, you change. You know why? Because God makes himself real to you. And because he becomes more real to you now, you don't want to do things that offend him. Not because you're afraid of going to hell, but because you're in love with him. That experience always creates more love and more trust. Because where there's perfect love, there's perfect trust. So people say, I love the Lord. I'm willing to do anything. Okay, let's see. I trust him with all my might. That's the problem. You don't have any might to trust him. You're still relying on you. <laughs> That's the enemy's plan is bring you to you. When you begin to rely on you to get things done, you won't. That's why there's submission in the area. See, now the doctrine is like bumpers. <laughs> you know, when somebody goes bowling, do you ever see those bumpers that come up? You know what? They always get the pins down. But when you begin to know how to flow in bowl, the bumpers come down. Not that you don't get it in the gutter once in a while, but you don't get it in the gutter not near as many times as you used to. Amen? Because there's a flow now, isn't there? Oh, hallelujah. First Peter chapter 1. Is everybody there? <laughs> Praise God. First Pete chapter 1 and verse 12. Verse 12, yes. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have, what? Have preached 
the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So did they have revelation? Yeah. Things which angels desire to look into. See, these things were not even revealed to angels. <laughs> Man, I, I, I can't, I, I don't know how to put into words of how much God loves me and you. You know, you and I are created a little below the angels, but the Bible says that when we die, we're like them. They don't even understand the fullness of what's being, what's going on with us. They still look at us and go, you, why do you love them? Man, you see what they did? I know they say that about me. Man, I, I used to go, all, I was all over the place in the world. Any angels that are assigned to me, I know they had to change sneakers every week. Hallelujah. I did so many things. I, I know they all had the, they, the throne had to be empty because everybody was on the floor laughing. Nobody was on the seat. Look what he did now. Oh, man, when I get home, they're going to go, yeah, he's right. <laughs> oh, man, you had this whole place cracked up some of the goofy things I've done and still do. But you know, the Lord is looking for somebody after his heart. That's what it's about. He's looking for somebody after his heart. He's looking for a son that wants to call him dad. He's looking for a daughter that says, Dad, hi, I'm checking in. I love you. I know you love me. Even though sometimes I need some convincing See, but you're honest with him. Don't go before the Lord. Oh, I humble myself mightily before you, Lord. Oh, puke. Oh, let me just humble myself mightily before you. Be careful, your own tail will slap you in the head. If you got to tell him, <laughs> hello, <laughs> if you got to tell him how you're coming before him, like he doesn't know, then there's no revelation. Because he already knows. <laughs> Glory. Verse 13. <laughs> Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on a father who, without partiality, judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in the fear of the Lord, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Reality of revelation. And I want to share with you now a revelation. We are entering 2012. 2012 is a time of unveiling. And I believe that more revelation will come to the body of Christ. It is the year of global government transition in its fight for power, 
position and control. We will give you copies of these. I don't have any tonight, but we'll give you some. But the continuous mobilizing of the army of God will cause many to enter a place of decision and awakening of reality. The decision to drink of the cup of the Lord or the cup of demon deception. The ground will continue to shake as a result of heaven's fight. A year of utmost awakening as the lies of promise are unveiled. Many will see Many will seek but not find because the hype of technology will overthrow the endurance of righteous common sense. You know, one of the things that you heard me speak on, I think it was Sunday, was about Facebook. And it's amazing because right after that, I saw uh, on the news, and they were talking about the dangerous Facebook. One of the things that they said that there have been more divorces because of Facebook than ever. They said there's been more things because of more dangers, more things that are happening because of Facebook. And Facebook is nothing but a self-promotion opinion. Well, people have to prove themselves and who they are, so they take a gazillion pictures and all kinds of forms and poses to proclaim self. Which is ridiculous in the eyes of God. It, it could be used for good, but not for self promotion, not for opinion. It causes division and strife and promotes lust if it's not used correctly. And it is the number one cause in this country for divorce. Think about that. The number one cause in this country for divorce is Facebook. That blew me away. Hallelujah. Okay. Let's go a little further. Again, I want to say this again. Many will seek but not find because of the hype of technology will overthrow the endurance of righteousness, of righteous common sense. The wife of deception will invade many of the minds with false expectations covered by delusion. But my people will stand strong to open the doors of truth, exposing the worship of creation instead of creator. The woe of Israel will be heard across the globe, and the cries of the despaired are laid on the deaf ears of no response. As disaster increase. Only will my people hear and move against the forces of the despaired, forsaken, and forgotten. They will be raised. They will be trained. And they will be sent, says the Lord. My hidden forces of righteousness will be called out of hiding for such a time as this. For they now carry the scars of suffering inflicted by the earth. And have earned my trust to receive more provision. The time is short. The days are long. But those who hear my voice. And obey my command. And substitute their will for my will. Will shine forth. With the fruits of harvest. The continued separation. Between the moon the earth and the sun. Will affect weather. Atmosphere and mode. Unleashing evil's desires. The moon worshippers of the crescent, the earth worshippers of the nature, and the sun worshippers of the truth will collide in various ways, but the truth will always prevail. Many will fall at this time, but many will rise because my army will be refreshed by the saturation of my anointing. Without this release of provision, anointing, and revelation, my strategy would be ignored. But it is coming forth, and my people will go forth. Without any of these things, they would go astray. Only those who love me will follow me. The rest will begin to turn to the world.
for help. Disasters and awakenings will cause watchmen to watch and soldiers to fight. Those who are mine. The ripple effect of New York. The ripple effect of New York's rebellion will spread across the country and collide with California's lustful imagination, producing a generated pompous atmosphere and increased self-righteousness and more delusion. Uprisings in the U.S. will cause some of the states to use martial law and will also use outside influence to maintain control. But the eternal government will prevail and begin his invasion because victory is ours. It's the time we are entering. There's a tremendous shift. I know that you'll have to read this probably over a couple times. I'm not sure what the circumstance of New York, but he just said that the ripple effect of New York's rebellion will reach across and it will meet with California's lustful imagination and it's going to cause a pompous atmosphere through the country. It's going to cause a delusion through the country. But you and I must stand. We must be careful not to turn back to the world, no matter what occurs. There is a fight right now in the area of government. Satan's kingdom is mobilizing itself. The Lord is mobilizing his kingdom too. The victory is already ours. We just have to walk it through no matter what the circumstances. Amen. So I encourage you to stand strong. Maintain the reality of revelation. Maintain the discipline and consistency so that the love of Christ can assist your endurance. Remember, one day, none of this will matter anymore. And we're getting closer and closer to that day. So get ready. Be prepared. Be ready in season and out as things begin to increase. Amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. And I ask that the seed be protected by the blood of Christ and it will grow and bear fruit for your glory. Lord, continue to... Yes. Lord, I pray everyone here become a watchman. Let the anointing of watchmen descend upon your people. That they have clarity to your voice and sensitivity to your presence. And that they become a sign and wonder. And that the reality of revelation will bring them to a place of experience. To know you more and more and more. Now may the blessings be released into their favor and that their needs be met far above all we could ever ask or think. Visit us in dreams and visions and make yourself so real to us that our love affair increases and our self is constantly denied that you would be glorified all of our days left here on this place in Jesus name and everybody said amen hallelujah give the Lord a mighty hand
third.